Remember that Rockwell versus fiberglass insulation video I made a few months ago? That harmless, fun, hopefully informative video? Well, last week I got a letter from the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of NIMA, which is the North American Insulation Manufacturers Association. They represent manufacturers of fiberglass, rock wool, and slag wool insulation products. A week after I posted that video, Owen Scorning set up a Zoom call and complained about my video for about 30 minutes. What's really suspicious is that everything they said is in this official letter from NIMA. This letter also seems to focus on my description of fiberglass and slag wool and not as much on rock wool. In all fairness, it's not rude or offensive at all. It's just really surprising that a relatively small YouTube channel can have such an impact. Along with this official letter, they also sent me pages of studies and research, and naturally, I went through all of it. So in this video, I'm going to summarize the four main points they had an issue with. First off, I said that respiratory protection, like a face mask, is required when working with both fiberglass and rock wool, which apparently isn't true. It is recommended to wear a mask when you're exposed to a space with more than one fiber per cubic centimeter over an eight-hour time period, which rarely ever happens. The few instances where you'd need an N95 respirator are when you're blowing loose fill insulation in an attic or wall cavities, when you're dumping or pouring unbonded bulk or specialty fiber products, and during insulation removal, repair or demolition. The Health and Safety Partnership Program has tested thousands of air samples from manufacturing facilities and installers, and the exposure levels are always below one fiber per cubic centimeter. Improvements to the product design and engineering controls have lowered the amount of fibers released. Unbonded insulation seems to release more fibers than bonded insulation, which makes sense. However, lab tests are one thing and reality is another, right? I ran a poll on my YouTube community page about this issue. A big thank you to the 513 people who participated in it. 82% of people said that they always cover up when handling fiberglass and 12% have never had any issues. Most people said that they get itchy throats and red bumps in their skin like I do if they don't wear a mask and long sleeves. One person said that foil-faced hullboard is the worst and itchiest fiberglass product he's ever had to deal with. Another person said that the pink pads used to feel much worse a decade ago, but it's much softer now. That's an interesting point. I wonder if the product has improved thanks to research and testing but since its appearance has stayed the same, its reputation hasn't changed. Either way, we can't discount personal experience. Even if the lab tests say that we don't need a mask, experience will tell us that we do. Next, I said that inhaling fibers can cause respiratory issues. The reason I said this is because in 1987, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, identified glass, stone, and slag wool as possible carcinogens or cancer-causing products. A cancer warning label had to be placed on all glass wool products. However, in 2001, after extensive research, they determined that glass fibers are not toxic and they do not increase the risk of lung cancer or mesothelioma. Glass fibers are biosoluble, which means that they dissolve in the lungs. Unlike asbestos, which has a crystalline molecular structure, glass fibers are amorphous and dissolvable. Also, fiberglass manufacturers have replaced formaldehyde binders with a starch-based binder. Formaldehyde is both a human carcinogen and an air pollutant. After replacing it, the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency found a 95% drop in hazardous air pollution emissions from fiberglass facilities. All this is new to me. I went by the info on research websites and competing manufacturers' websites, which is apparently outdated. Just like the previous point, fiberglass can't seem to shake off its reputation from 30 years ago. It's great to know that it isn't toxic and that it's biosoluble, but I will still wear a mask to prevent the itchiness in the back of my throat, even if it's temporary. Naima's third issue is that I said slag wool is inferior to rock wool. They think that is a flat and unsubstantiated claim, which is false and misleading because there is no basis for the comparison. Okay, there are a couple of reasons why I said that. First, logical reasoning. Before the recent spike in prices, thermofiber, which contains 80 to 100% recycled slag and minimal basalt, cost $2.60 per bat. 
safe and sound, which is mainly made of basalt rock, cost $4.60 per bat. During my call with the slag wool manufacturer, they couldn't give me a reason for that significant price difference. It's almost 50% cheaper. I've also found that slag wool disintegrates more easily than rock wool. The second reason is this research I found online on the high acidity coefficient of slag wool compared to rock wool. The research found that slag wool is aging intolerant, its pH is higher than that of rock wool, and its water resistant can be only moderately stable or unstable. They also discussed thermal conductivity performance, sulfur content, and corrosion resistance. I realized that the slag samples they were testing might have been inferior. Y'all know that I'm not trying to bring down companies on this channel. I'm exploring this realm of building science products and technology. I had never even heard of slag wool until I made that video. It is lumped in with basalt rock wool or it's just called mineral wool. But it is a different product. How can the ingredients be so different but the end products and performance are the same? I'd love to be involved in scientific tests comparing the materials and learning more about them. And if I'm wrong, I'll admit it. And now the last point, which doesn't make any sense to me. They say that no insulation product can claim to be environmentally friendly because it suggests that the production has no impact on the environment. With all due respect, what the f- You all know how much I despise greenwashing, hence that video. But if we go by this Federal Trade Commission or FTC definition, there is nothing in the world that is green or environmentally friendly. Every single product has an impact on the environment, but we can quantify that impact through things like embodied carbon or embodied energy. Wood fiberboard, for example, is carbon negative in Europe. Are we not allowed to say that it is better for the environment than other more energy intensive products or petroleum based products? This letter says that all insulation product manufacturers collect and process raw materials and create the end product with the process that requires energy of some sort. This is not exclusive to insulation. Also, if that's the case, why do you claim that your role is to promote energy efficiency and environmental preservation through the use of glass, rock, and slag wool insulation? Isn't the term environmental preservation just as taboo as environmentally friendly? Again, I don't have some ulterior motive to bring down Naima or any other company. I'd just like to explore this realm of building science in peace. This was very informative though, and I learned a lot. When I speak to manufacturers that are trying to introduce a new innovative product to the market, they tell me about all the hurdles that they face, whether it's laws and codes, our value requirements, or going up against the old school big dogs in the industry. I kind of get it now. Anyway, thanks Naima for watching my video and sharing all this info with me. If you have any issues with this video, I'm sure you'll let me know. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching. See ya.